Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. I know, right? That's a lot of responsibility, but thankfully it's shared by Paul Boyer, Brad, Kevin Morgan, and a brand new person to help us all out, Jason. Welcome, Jason. Woo-hoo. Yay, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Oh. On this episode of DTNS, what Apple might use AI for beyond its WWDC announcements, hint, it's robots, plus you might not want to use Bartender for the Mac for a while, and Scott Johnson helps us understand that for good or ill, AI is changing gaming. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, June 5th, 2024. Accept no substitutes. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. Are you? Uh, <laughs> Prove it. That... You never know with Roger. Yeah, I don't know if that's accusation or a question. <laughs> it was, yeah, we're not accepting <laughs> substitutes, so I just want to make sure it's the authentic, real Roger Chang that we all want and expect. Uh, I can say something surly. <laughs> there, there we go. <laughs> that's perfect. That's all we needed. Thank you. Yes, we're on the right track. Uh, Sarah, I have a it's question. What's would you like Tom? to start the quick hits? I would. <laughs> We're punchy today, but we do have news. <laughs> Twitch announced Tuesday it's raising subscription prices for its Tier 1 customers in the U.S. from $4.99 to $5.99 on July 11th. This is notably the first time the monthly price has been raised in the U.S. In a post on X, Twitch also said streamers will still be earning the same 50 to 70% through Twitch's revenue-sharing program, so they will, in theory, earn more <laughs> per subscription. Netflix announced it will no longer support its apps on second and third generation Apple TVs, which are more than 12 years old at this point. Most of you are driving cars newer than that. Uh, Not me, but many of you. (laughs) You have until July 31st to find a replacement. They'll keep working until then. Uh, And uh, just for comparison, Apple stopped servicing those Apple TV devices five years ago or more. Search Engine Land published analysis by SEO platform Bright Edge that shows that Google's AI overviews, you know, those are the AI-generated answers that show up at the top of a Google search, some Google searches anyway, and have made the news for being a little hallucinatory at times, Mm. have dropped from appearing in 84% of queries to 15%. No, it depends on the query. The data shows AI overviews are 195% more likely to appear when queries have a featured snippet, and question-based queries are more likely to feature AI overviews also. They also show up most often in healthcare. That's still down from 76% in January, now hovering around 63% of healthcare-related queries, uh, as far as Google is concerned. AI overviews now also appears less than 1% of the time for both restaurants and travel. Huh. Uh, Speaking of Google, they also announced uh, they are acquiring software virtualization company Cameo. Not Cameo, the place where you pay celebrities to make you a message, but C-A-M-E-Y-O. Google and Cameo started working together last year to offer virtualized legacy Windows desktop apps in Chrome OS. So that is not new to Chrome OS, uh, but they're working closer now. Uh, Cameo mostly targets businesses who want to move to Chrome OS, but they have some Windows apps that would make the transition difficult. Cameo can virtualize those in a way that makes them feel like they're just running on Chrome OS. The acquisition will, of course, make it easier for them to increase that integration. A new issue with Apple's screen time has come to light. This one includes features for parents to restrict access to various apps and website and content on their kids' devices or a guardian type thing. A bug in the app is letting users get around web browsing content restrictions, for example, an adult website, by typing a series of special characters into the Safari browser URL. And the Wall Street Journal's Joanna Stern reports that this was previously already reported to Apple by security researchers multiple times over the last three years. Apple said in a statement, it's made substantial screen time fixes in the latest iOS 17.5 release and will continue doing so. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman reports Apple is officially going with OpenAI to bring ChatGPT to iOS 18, rumored to be offered as an opt-in service. We're obviously going to know a lot more about this at WWDC next week. Apple will reportedly be in partnership with OpenAI temporarily because it wants to bring AI technology in-house. 
that's not surprising if you think about Apple Silicon replacing Intel chips, for example. However, here's some other interesting tidbits that we probably won't hear about next week, but you never know. German also says Apple wants to use large language models to help power a pair of robotic devices that it is secretly developing. These could include a, t a tablet top robotic arm with a large iPad like display, a mobile robot that could follow you around the house, handle chores, that type of thing, and AirPods with cameras and AI features. Now we've heard a little bit, little bit of rumors about the AirPods with cameras. None of it really went anywhere. But Scott, uh, thinking about robotic devices, uh, it, you know, it, you know, it, preceding the actual announcements that we're going to hear next week, do you want a robot assistant? Oh man, I mean, there's a part of me that gets very cynical about these things that looks at what we got with the Amazon little dude, the little robo guy. You guys tested it, in fact. Um, and it and it all I get a little like okay you think we want this but we don't really want this or show me something that's truly special or whatever, but if I'd be lying if I didn't say a part of me wants these advanced models to show up in helpful useful ways. So the idea of like a, a tabletop based arm that will sort of move a display around based on what I need it to do, as someone who streams a lot and has a lot of displays open and needs a lot of information at, at the at the ready, that sounds kind of interesting to me. Um, but in, you know, in practice, I'd need to see it. And I also know it'd be very expensive. So it's not the kind of thing I can just spend money on if I don't know how the thing's going to work first. So whatever they do show, even if they come close to showing some of this far out stuff, German mentions, they need to really, really go deep on why I need it. Um, I feel like all of the AI stuff recently, all these events and all these conferences have all gotten up and tried to explain to me what their products are doing with integrating AI, but none of them have gone far enough, I think, in my own personal opinion, mm -hmm. to telling me what I'm going to do with this stuff. How will it help my life uh, beyond the obvious stuff? You know, I think the GPTs of the world, they make sense. Chatbots make sense to me. But explain how all these other integrations into your regular technical products are really, truly going to help me. So my guess is the way the, the form I'll get that in is, is whatever Siri is now. That will be the thing that they are going to really focus on, and they're going to explain to us, hopefully, why it's going to matter and why it's so much better than what we have now and what it can actually do for me in my day-to-day -day life. If they can you know, do that in a way that's meaningful and not have it just be new models, if they can use some, some you know, couple-year-old chips to still do this stuff on device or however they're going to present it, then I'm in. But I, I just need to be told what I'm going to get out of this thing before I you know, always have to guess. Because right now I feel like I guess all the time with these products. That's yeah, the, But that's, that's what Apple's best at, right? They are good they, at it. Yeah. They tell you this is what it's good for. And they they don't always tell you all of the specs and underlying tech that maybe you would like to know, right? But they're very good at saying you're going to like this because it will do this for you. I would expect that on Monday. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if they never even mentioned OpenAI's name. Uh, I, I imagine they might, but the story implicates or uh, in, implies that they they might not limit themselves to open AI for cloud stuff, and eventually they want to replace it. So Apple's focus on end results is going to be, yeah, an improved Siri, but also they're going to show you something in photos. They're going to show you something in mail. They're going to show you something in reminders. They're going to show you a bunch of things that are improved in those apps, and they're going to talk about them as improvements in those apps yeah. that are fed by their own models. And then for the few things they have to go to the cloud for, that will be where they would have the opportunity to say, now, in these cases, we anonymize your data and send it to the cloud and our third party provider, and maybe they say open AI. Down the road, they're going to have to do the same thing with the robot, and that's harder. And right. they haven't really done it with the Apple Vision show, right? So it's easy to explain Pro. to me Apple Pro. like. Pro. I'm sorry. <laughs> I keep doing that. I keep doing that. It's good yeah, marketing. Vision Pro. One of them is apparently more important to me than the other. Uh, yes, it's fine. Uh, yes, they have not done that with I the show Pro. Vision Actually, they haven't the done it with day. the show and either, like, and I'd like them to do that too. But uh, yeah. no, with the robots, like they really need to explain, like because we all know why photos is important, and we, I can imagine how AI would make it better for me. Explain why I need a robot that follows me around because nobody yeah. else has been able to. Yeah, and also just uh, as a side note, I think there's a lesson to learn from the Microsoft presentation on the screen recording thing that will just record everything you ever do and then smartly give it back to you when you need it or whatever. They did, I think, a very good job of explaining how the technology works 
and did not do a very good job of explaining how this will benefit you directly. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think there's a chance here for them to, like, I think Tom's absolutely right. It's like, you already use mail. You already use calendar stuff. You already use this, that, and the other thing. What if all those things were demonstrably better because we're going to use AI to make them better? And here's how well it'll be secure. You know, add all those, sprinkle all that in, but just give us some rubber to road examples of how we already use your devices and how much better that'll be instead of saying, what if we gave you this far-flung thing that we haven't really sold you on and we're not even sold on yet, nobody knows right. going to be Right, and now your whole day is different, right. and you're using new apps. And, I mean, all of us, <laughs> we like to tinker around with new apps more than the average person. Sure. But the average person doesn't really want to do that. It's like, you know, you know, change is scary. What I will say, I'm interested in hearing more about, and I don't really think we're going to hear about this next week, but the idea of the AirPods that have cameras and AI features. We have th this is a rumor that's been kind of kind of circulating already, and I don't hate the idea. I love my AirPods. I would like my AirPods to have more AI features beyond what Siri can give me. Um, and I also think, huh, if there are cameras, then I you know, assuming this is going to be an AR thing, I would have to have glasses that are paired to the AirPods, but the glasses themselves wouldn't need to have cameras. And maybe that could make oh. the glass models not so limited to what you can do I, because you have to put cameras in them. I understood that the AirPod camera was just to understand what's around you and be able to adjust volume and all of that better. I mean, maybe that's the case, but that seems pretty limiting. And it's like, man, if you're going to put cameras in my AirPods, <laughs> well, but you could do fun. things like say, like you know, uh, uh, is that a Ralph's? <laughs> and it'll say, no, that's a Safeway, or you know what I mean, Pro or more practical versions of that. But sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, huh. we'll we'll find out. We will someday, possibly. Uh, Meanwhile, here's an immediate thing you can act on, uh, whether or not to use Bartender on macOS or not. And I know some of you already do. Bartender is an app for macOS that gives you customization control over the menu bar. So you can put things in the menu bar that aren't able to be put there otherwise. You can change little drop-down menus. You can create hotkeys. A lot of people love it, especially if you're a customizer. You can, you can do what you want. Create your productivity layout the way you want. Another piece of Mac software that is related to the story is Mac Updater. That helps you keep all your Mac apps up to date, right? It can just automatically update, tell you what's up to date. It can ask you for permission. It can just do the updates itself. And one thing it can do is give you a warning before updating an app that is a little bit questionable for whatever reason. That's what it did recently. On April 22nd, Mac Updater's developers noticed that the code signature for Bartender had changed from Surtees Studios, which was the developer of it for years, to App Sub One LLC. Now, that signature was linked to a company, a developer that had some low popularity and, in Mac Updater's opinion, low quality apps. So that raised an eyebrow, but it was a legitimate company. However, the homepage for that developer seemed to be just a generated SEO page. Then, on May 15th, with the one eyebrow already raised for Mac Updater, the release was signed by Bartender App LLC. That company never signed an app before. That caused Mac Updater to say, you know what? We are not going to recommend updating this. They pushed a notice to Mac Updater users that said, the company and developer behind Bartender was replaced in a silent and dubious manner. Updates to version 5.052 and newer are your, at your own risk and responsibility. In other words, Mac Updater says, you can update them if you want. We're not going to get involved. So folks on Reddit began talking about that. And a user called ordinary underscore delivery underscore 79 waited in and said, I'm from the new bartender owners. We just bought it two months ago. Sorry. We told people by email about this. We, we posted it on our website. We should have put it in the release notes, but you're all fine. Everybody's cool. Just go ahead and update bartender. It's just little or less. I went and looked at the website. The only thing I found was a note related to the 5.052 update that said the new update involved a one-time certificate change. This is valid and expected, which is not how you validate a certificate uh, by just saying it on a blog. They still <laughs> didn't say anything about the new owners. So we have a situation where a lot of people have done some detective work and they think 
that Applause Group is the new owner. Uh, they're a company that just buys apps from developers and then monetizes them. They they do a bunch of SEO and paid marketing and that to just squeeze money out of them. Uh, not a great group. And combined with the fact that Bartender requires uh, screen capture uh, permission, I would recommend not using Bartender for now uh, until there's a better explanation of who's behind developing it. And, 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 and it's been vetted a couple more times by some security researchers. It is not the way a handover of a developer should happen. They're not being particularly transparent. They just might be kind of awkward at it. That's possible. Uh, yeah. But with the permissions you give Bartender, I need more than that before I would be willing to recommend it. Yeah, the the if the former uh, <laughs> developer of Bartender, uh, you know, development team, you know, whoever it is, was like, you know what, we'd like to move on to other things, maybe get a cash payout. It's time, you know. Let let's you know let, let's uh, pass the baton. That happens all the time. That in itself is not a big problem, but with the secrecy of the new company. Um, and just, yeah, just, I don't even, don't even call it secrecy, just the wonkiness about lack of transparency, right? Exactly. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Um, that, that leads me to think, well, they wanted the money. They knew that if there was a, an announcement about who was buying, um, mm -hmm. uh, bartender, people would beat up in arms because it's a very beloved app. Yeah. And people of, loved Ben Surtees, the, the developer of it before. Right. So so if you just kind of do it quietly and just sort of maybe it goes away type thing, uh, that doesn't work out well. I mean, sometimes it does, but <laughs> but, but when you're when people find out that uh, that's the way that you've been um, going about things, it doesn't land well. That's for sure. So that that's I that's my biggest problem. I mean, maybe the the new owner is there's not going to be any you know nefariousness, data stolen, any of that stuff. But just the way that it's handled it, uh, puts puts a uh, puts a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths. Yeah. I, also, the first thing that came to my mind is how <laughs> how this kind of supports the idea of why a an app store is a worthy endeavor. You know, I have lots of issues with app stores and trying to keep everything within a a place where you know I used to be able to just go online and get what I need and run it, and now they I jump through hoop, hoops for that. It's still possible, but it's not as easy as it used to be. Well. For stuff like this, it makes sense. We got a, a curated method of saying these have all passed muster, so you can feel safe in downloading these. So if, if this had been something in there, right now Bartender is not available on the Mac App Store at all. Uh, there's some alternatives to it in there, but um, there is some there is some comfort in knowing that these things have passed the test, whatever those tests are, and you can find out all about that. So. I'm not saying I'm not even going to say that I have an even improved uh, vision for what app stores can provide as curated by Apple or Windows or anyone else. But this is maybe an example of why those things exist and why we maybe want them in some cases. Uh, and thank you for Michael in the YouTube chat uh, pointing out that Ben Surtees just posted on both his own blog and the bartender blog to sort of clear the air on this and said, yes, I sold the company to Applause Group. Uh, he says that uh, they are trustworthy. They have a valid Apple ID, developer ID. I know there were some problems with the notarization of their certificate. I want to assure you that Applause is dedicated to maintaining the integrity and quality of Bartender. Their team is already hard at work on exciting updates and enhancements. I have full confidence in their ability to support and grow the app, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That makes me feel quite a bit better. Uh, I would go from don't use Bartender to be careful using bartender uh, based on that fact, because it makes me know like, okay, it is the applause group. Uh, they are a valid people. Maybe you don't want to do business with them. That's a different situation. Uh, and I still think that there probably needs to be some audits on, on what this thing's doing, but uh, good, good for Ben Surtees for finally doing that. It's a little bit too late uh, for a lot of people, but I guess better late than never. The big concern here is supply chain attacks. XZUtils was taken over by people who put malicious software in it uh, without telling people they had taken it over. So when something like Bartender is taken over and you didn't know it was taken over, it's going of to course, make people yeah. very suspicious these days. 
Uh, well, if you have feedback about anything that gets brought up on the show, by all means, get in touch with the DTNS audience on the socials at DTNS show on X, DTNS show at mstdn.social on Mastodon, Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, and DTNS Picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram and threads. <laughs> In yesterday's quick hits, we noted that Samsung's new 32-inch Odyssey OLED G8 gaming monitor uses an AI processor to upscale content. Samsung's Neo QLED 8K TV does that too. At Computex, AMD CEO Dr. Lisa Su said in her keynote, quote, game developers will want to use more AI. Not everything has to be rendered, implying that, you know, upscaling, it's here to stay. NVIDIA, of course, showed off G-Assist AI chatbot that can do some optimizing of your game settings for you, as well as help you out in game. Scott, we've talked about AI making NPCs more interesting, helping developers create more detailed worlds, uh, but AI is continuing to expand as a tool in gaming. Yeah, for sure. Um, obviously, this will affect a bunch of businesses, but I think you're going to see some of the earliest examples of this in gaming. Gaming often is the place where we push boundaries. It's not even about the game so much as it is showing off the technology. Um, and it's it's easy in this process of AI kind of taking over everything, or at least in our minds, to go straight to things like, oh, they're going to take all the art jobs, they're going to, you know, replace the need to do voiceovers or music or story writing in some cases, this sort of thing. I think it's, we're, we're getting to a point where we can actually start admitting to ourselves this is a much deeper thing and is much more fundamental to the creation process and how we're ultimately going to get those games in front of us. And we'll get to that in a second, but um, it's going to provide some shortcuts Right away, I've been talking to some developer friends who are talking about terrain building. In the past, you had to do a bunch of stuff on your own um, and uh, build some things that some players are never going to see. They're never going to look at the things you build. And that's a little disconcerting. Um, it reminds me of CGI artists who make bullets happen in TV shows so that nobody gets hurt. And they do it completely in post with, with CGI bullets ricocheting off things, breaking things, hitting the dirt. And the viewer has no idea. They don't even ask the question. Those people never really get true credit for what they've done. You're going to start seeing a lot more of that in the games being handled by AI because those things are tedious. Uh, they have to be done, but they don't have to be curated or crafted in the same way that maybe other aspects of the game do. So I think that'll be one of the first things you see when you start building an MMO. This is already happening with a lot of projects that I'm aware of. They sit down and an AI goes, blah, here's a world, bunch of mountains, here's a forest, here's some trees, here's an ice area, here's another biome, here's some swamps. And all of that is just sort of barfed out there in a reasonably okay way. And then the, the developers go in and they tweak this, they move that. They have tools to, to, to finite, make it more final, final in the final uh, game. But this is a huge time saver. Uh, prototyping phases of games is an area you're going to see this in as well where games go from concept to a somewhat playable concept much faster than it used to take. Um, and that is a big deal. So big changes across those sorts of things. Um, letting the computers handle stuff that you don't need to think about as a developer is a big deal because the idea being you can spend more time on gameplay, more time on crafting the parts that you do want to be human crafted and, and that sort of thing. But here's the biggest hang up I have about the whole thing or the biggest concern I have. And that is... Great. These are cool technologies that for the end user might be more easily rendered to us using AI powered monitors, AI powered GPU stuff, uh, things like DLSS with uh, NVIDIA now, and also uh, AMD's equivalent. Uh, that's their FSR, I believe, or yeah, FSR it's called. These are great. They do great upscaling technologies, a little more AI in the DLSS uh, version of this, but they're, they're uh, brand standards. So NVIDIA's got DLSS, they've got FSR, others have whatever they have. And the problem with that is it's not based on a universal standard. And I worry because this stuff is going to be so fundamental to how it's delivered to you that your TV will have a role in this. Your monitor will, your GPU might, your console that you buy in the future might. All of these things are how you're being delivered, the visuals and the content of the game. If if we're going to be super stoked about how AI will make all of that better, faster, cheaper, blah, 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 they are going to need to decide on some standards as an industry. And so I, <laughs> they're not listening to me, but if they were, I would just say, <laughs> come to a table. This is the perfect example of when you need a standard. It's like railroads or anything else. You're going to all be using these rails. 
So figure out a way to all be on the same page with this thing. And I realize they all want the gold rush. Everybody is trying to be best top whatever. Everyone hopes their idea becomes the standard. I just worry we're looking at years of trying to figure that out. And in the meantime, consumers will suffer um, because, well, wait, this won't play on this monitor? Well, it will, but you're going to sacrifice this and that and the other thing. What about this GPU? Oh, it works real well over here. But if you've got this GPU and it's one number off, well, you're not going to be able to play the game the same. That yeah. is a mess and will disrupt this industry in a way we don't want. They, uh, the game makers can use their leverage to put pressure on that kind of standardization, too, because right. they're, the, they're the ones who make or break whether these chips are useful or not by supporting this. And if they, they start saying, we want a standard, that, that makes it more possible for it to happen. I agree. Yeah. yeah. It, would, it would be nice if they didn't just immediately go, well, we're going to use the, N or the DLSS standard or whatever the new standard is because they paid us. Because that happens, too. There's a lot of pay-for-play to have the bright logos load up when your game launches, these sorts of yep, things. Yep. So I don't know. I, I I try not. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be really optimistic about the future of this. And I and I overall I am. I just think there's going to be some weird fighting before we get to those standards. Once that happens, you know, the world's our oyster. Let's go. Yeah. Go beyond just upscaling, and and some of that terrain development could actually happen on device. Yeah. You know, it could just be generated locally, and that saves you download. That makes cloud gaming work better. And. Mm -hmm. All kinds of stuff. Yep. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Mike wrote in with some insight on how he consumes DTNS, which is always something that we, as the creators of DTNS, are interested in as well. Mike says, I watch the standard DTNS every weekday morning on YouTube. I come into work, I open up YouTube on one of my monitors, and I watch the previous day's episode. It's my morning newspaper. If the show has particularly interesting news or discussions, then I go to the Patreon website, find the extended version, open that up on YouTube, and then I watch the pre or post show. Mike says, I know many people like the audio podcast, but I'm an old tech TV fanboy, so I like mm -hmm. seeing Tom, Sarah, Roger, and even Patrick, when uh, Norton, when you have him on screen. He obviously likes you too, Scott. I like the graphics that Roger puts up with each story also. You're my morning show for tech geeks. I'm not sure if that's good or bad or helpful to you. Well, it's it's good and helpful. It's certainly yeah, not bad, no, it's Mike. it's always it's always interesting to to see how how people consume what we do, uh, and I think more people are doing what Mike is doing and and watching YouTube first, uh, maybe podcast or not. Right, uh, we are just a show, and there's all different kinds of ways that that people consume it. So, uh, thanks, Mike, for for writing in and, and explaining that. It's awesome. It's good. Always good to hear those kinds of things. Indeed. We also got a post from a non-junior in relation to our discussion on the post show yesterday about a uh, mechanical third thumb. Uh, a non-junior says, there are times I think an extra thumb would have come in handy trying to do repair work on instruments, especially trying to hold the clamp, the patch, the padding, and close the clamp all before the glue dries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. When it comes to... Yeah, repairs and... We were trying to imagine, like, okay, what practical use could this yeah, be put like, to like, beyond accessibility, which was the obvious one. And this, this is one I never would have thought of, repairing exactly. instruments. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Relevant to a non-junior's daily life. <laughs> Indeed. Well, Scott Johnson, you're re relevant to our lives, and we thank you for being relevant. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you're also relevant in a lot of other ways in your life. So let folks know what you're up to today. Well, uh, my extra thumb goes for snacks. But my uh, stuff I want to tell you about is uh, this week, uh, speaking of uh, the world of video games, there is the big summer fest. Jeff Keighley's summer fest happens every year right around this time. It's a little bit of a partial replacement for E3. Um, game Awards and other stuff that come later are as well. But we're going to be live casting a simulcast of that on Friday night, uh, myself and those on the podcast core that are my co-hosts. And we're going to watch that entire thing, break it all down, do it live, uh, as well as put it up on the hard drive or the hard drive on the podcast after. There will be hard drives involved. I can promise you that. Anyway, uh, that'll be this Friday. Check it out. Uh, Frogpants.com slash core for all the details. Get subbed up and ready for it. We are excited. Thanks for uh, Thanks for having me on again today. Summerfest reminds me of that building on a corner that's triangle shaped because there were other <laughs> buildings when it was built, but they're gone now. Yeah. And it's, you're like, why is that such a weird shape for that? Building? That's a good point. Yeah. They're yeah. they weird shape or not. It is. That's the one here to stay. So yeah, we, that we building's still well. there. Yeah. All right, Mike and all the other patrons, uh, you might want to check out Patreon for the post show. Good day. Internet. 
Why would a man nail himself into a spinning wooden box? Well, obviously for Twitch subscriptions, but do these stunts deserve your attention? We're going to talk about that. Just a reminder, we do the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. We would love to have you join us live if you can. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS Family of Podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>